Hello everyone, my name is Nicholas Babaya and thank you for listening to the very first episode of Rational Standards' own podcast, How to Build the Roads. As a team, Rational Standard, we decided that we had to start a new form of media in order to expand our reach on the internet. For a few years now, we have been publishing articles at rationalstandard.com and we even eventually into print media with uh, our very first book, Fallism, which was an edited version of some of our best articles over our first year. Um, however, as times are changing, uh, news outlets are reaching into different sectors of the media, putting videos up, podcasts, and so on and so forth, and many of these podcasts have proven to be extremely successful. So here I am, and uh, we'll see how this goes. We'll be inviting some interesting people to come and talk, and uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our first guest. So on the show today, you will hear me having a conversation with Mr. Ron Weissenberg. Now, Ron Weissenberg is a resident of Grahamstown, where I'm currently residing, uh, he's a libertarian and a, a business owner and a guy who gets involved with an organization called Makana Revive, which has recently been repairing potholes and infrastructure. And you will hear him talk about this later on in the episode. Uh, but the reason I invited Ron to come on was that he strikes me as a kind of libertarian who gets out and does things. I think too often as libertarians we can sit behind our computers and talk about ideology and fiscal policy till we're blue in the face. But to actually get out and go make a difference is something that is, I think, severely lacking in the libertarian community. And Ron explains exactly how you can do that. And this is why I've decided to call the podcast How to Build the Roads, because when somebody asks us who will build the roads, the answer should be we will. So without further ado, here is Ron Weissenberg. And we're here with Ron Weissenberg. Ron, thanks very much for coming to chat with us on the podcast. You're most welcome. So, Ron, uh, I was very intrigued when I first heard about the projects that Makana Revive has been doing here in our little town of Grahamstown. And uh, I'm going to start off by simply asking you guys, uh, you have been fixing the roads in this town, which at times have looked like the face of the moon, uh, and I felt it as a motorist whose car needs to be serviced and have the uh, shocks redone. Um, how do private citizens go about fixing infrastructure, which I think the majority of South Africans just sort of take for granted that this is something that the government should and must do, something as basic as the road? How do private citizens go about doing that? Well, the short answer is they just do it. And in the case of Makana Revive, which is the organization that... Uh, was founded together with uh, business leaders and movers and shakers in Grahamstown. We decided that enough was enough, that we would establish a trust account and an infrastructure to allow private industry and contractors to attend to some of the infrastructure needs of Grahamstown that had deteriorated. So the short answer is you just get on and do it. Right then, but what about funding? I mean, something like this is obviously quite expensive. Uh, I've heard uh, some of the quotes for how much roads cost to build, and these are obviously just potholes that we're filling, but I'm sure it requires a lot of equipment, a lot of uh, logistics and stuff like that. How does that get pulled together? The funding model that we use is voluntary, consensual fundraising. So we appeal to the general community to give whatever resources they are able, and it could be money, but often it's just their time, contacts, communication, or skills and abilities. You're correct that it is expensive to maintain roads, but the maintenance of a road in terms of pothole filling, uh, sealing of fissures and cracks, is a small fraction of what it costs to redo a road completely. And I understand as well, I remember you mentioning once that uh, you said now that the funding was done voluntarily, and I heard that I think some of the fundraising was done a bit over Facebook and, and, and social media and uh, reaching out to the community. Was, was that correct? Did you guys use uh, social media to try spread the word? Yes, correct. Look, I, I'm a newbie to social media, but I highly recommend it. Yeah. Uh, it has some great applications. Just to let your listeners uh understand how McConnell Revive came about, we as an organization originally decided purely to look at those items that central government were not attending to. And that was specifically safety and security, 
where there are crime issues and they were not being adequately dealt with by the South African police services who are either undermanaged, underled or underfunded, and also to create an enabling environment to attract families, human capital and businesses to Grahamstown and the greater Makana municipality. Again, it is the function of central government to create an environment in which people can live and prosper. And there was no evidence of government doing that. So the other part of Makana Revive was to look at aesthetics and how to improve the town to make it attractive for those people and businesses to consider settling. The pothole repair project came pretty much like a bolt out of the blue, and uh, no pun intended, but it, it was as a result of the rains toward the end of 2017, where the already deteriorated roads were getting to a point where they were becoming irreparable. In other words, it wasn't viable to repair them. And as you've pointed out, it costs substantially more to redo a road. In fact, the quotations that we received is it's approximately three and a half million rand per kilometer to redo. Per kilometer. Per kilometer to redo effectively a double road, not a highway, purely a normal municipal road. Well, that's quite astounding. Three, three and a half, you say three and a half million rand. Three and a half million rand per kilometer. Jeez. That is for the preparation and the resurfacing of a road. And this information, by the way, uh, sorry to interrupt you, I, I believe that in your team you have a guy who has an engineering background who came up with uh, this. Well, we're fortunate in the committee of McConnell Revive, we have three engineers, um, and this information is published and readily available. Uh, this is not our information, but in fact is part of information available to the public, and some of which was commissioned by the government and SANREL, the National Roads Agency themselves. Okay, well, this is all very interesting, uh, explaining how, the, how things get to how they are, and uh, I think the most amazing thing for me is that I've seen a very tangible difference from when I arrived back in Grahamstown to come back to Varsity at about a week or two later, and I'm still seeing the truck doing a few things now and again. Now, the amazing thing for me is that um, we have here a town in a very poor and, to boot, insolvent municipality, which has a number of problems in terms of crime, in terms of infrastructure, especially with our water uh, reticulation, which we can perhaps touch on a little bit later, and a group of citizens on their own volition got together to fix these potholes. And I, I find that really quite an amazing and and a really encouraging and, and positive initiative. And it, it almost gives me a bit of hope, you know. I think sometimes we're a bit dreary, but it, it does really show the power of community when people get together uh, for things like uh, these, don't you think? Nick, we never started out to make this an entire community project. We simply took a decision to obtain quotes and get a particular technology in to repair potholes. We accumulated funds, we put down the guarantees, the contractor arrived, and on the day that he started, we put out a small Facebook request on the Grahamstown website for donations. And within a few hours, we had something like 6,000 hits, and the posting went viral, and we were getting donations from as far afield as Angola, never mind Greater wow. Grahamstown. And not only donations in money, but people actually coming up to the crew, uh, which started off in uh, Jorza, uh, Finger Village, on the eastern side of Grahamstown, and offering refreshments, encouragement, uh, meals. Uh, we had donations of accommodation for the contractors, and the outpouring of support uh, was incredibly encouraging. So what started out as really a very limited private initiative on its own order of spontaneity uh, became a community thing. Well, it's really fantastic to hear. I think it's just a, a really lovely story. And I think part of the reason why I really wanted to talk to you about this and, 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 and put it out for the public to hear is that we have a number of towns in South Africa 
which are very similar to Grahamstown, probably similar in size, uh, similar in the state of their governance. Maybe the infrastructure is also not so great. Grahamstown is unique, certainly, in the fact that it has a number of uh, very highly regarded schools as well as Rhodes University in the area. Uh, but the reason I, I really was interested in, in chatting to you is that I hope the listeners can hear this and, and try and make a difference in whatever residential area that they live and try and get their own Makana revive. Perhaps if you're in Queenstown, you can get the Chris Harney municipality revive, or if you're in uh, Port Alfred or Kenton, also, I have to be honest, the, the, the infrastructure there seems quite good, actually. I suppose the Entlambe does a, a municipality might do a bit better, I don't know. Now, now besides the roads, there are another, a number of infrastructure problems that, that this municipality has. Uh, what do you say is next on the uh, horizon for Makana revive? Do you guys have any more plans immediately, or...? Well, other than pothole repair and refurbishing roads where we can, we have also, in collaboration with the local business forum, uh, sponsored a number of livestock proof, or as livestock proof as you can get, uh, refuse bins which are serviced by a private entity. They're emptied three times a week and relined. Uh, those are dotted around the CBD and are now being introduced into the suburban areas. Those rubbish bins have signage, they have advertising, and they are sponsored either by individu- individual businesses or several, in our case, sponsored by McConnor Revive. In addition to that, we have started to install and have monitored 24-7 closed-circuit TV cameras these are the next-gen cameras, yes. which have a number of unique features, which make them far more effective than your standard static CCTV camera. And as funding permits, we want to introduce more and more of these cameras, which in turn are monitored by a private company and a private armed response team, uh, with the full support, by the way, of the South African Police Service. Oh, that's wonderful then. That's wonderful to hear. And I think that's a great segue to my next question was, what was what my next question was going to be. And that is that I think crime is another, you know, ever-present problem in this town, unfortunately, as it is in most places in South Africa. I think it's almost tragic, the crime problem that this country has. And I would almost go so far as to label it a, a crisis. I think it affects the way South Africans live I think our quality or standard of living, and and this is all South Africans really, is diminished by needing to worry about this extra problem, uh, which can, if you are a victim of it, be extremely traumatic and and really scar you for the rest of your life. I've heard a number of really, really horrible stories from friends of mine who have been mugged or had worse things. Now, I remember you, the reason I bring this up is I remember you mentioning earlier that one of the goals of McConnor Revive, and correct me if I'm phrasing this wrong, was to provide an environment which is attractive for people to come live and and do business in. And crime seems to me to be, you know, a a massive issue uh, in this town. Uh, And you've mentioned now that security cameras are getting put up. Um, I wanted to ask, is there any sort of initiative... Uh, on the horizon with regards to uh, community watch sort of programs, uh, regulation of car guards who unfortunately have been known to mug uh, certainly students from uh, my knowledge, uh, any, anything like that um, from McConnor Revive? I think McConnor Revive has to be very careful in not overextending itself. Yeah. They are, we, we are very blessed to have uh, an incredibly talented panel and committee, and we have tremendous input from the community. Crime, as you said, is one of the worst uh, issues facing South Africa. Uh, But if there is a presence, if people are aware that there's monitoring, you find that there's a natural decline in crime rates. And a lot of the crime in Grahamstown is regrettably petty crime. And it's, uh, by and large, poor indigent folk who, through desperation, do crime. Yes, So by providing an enabling environment for businesses, families, human capital to settle, which has a whole lot of spin-off effects, uh, in turn, employment, job, wealth creation occurs and 
that is probably the best way of reducing crime, in addition to the population being aware that uh, streets and roads are being monitored. Community watch systems uh, were very popular in the past. I think we have to face the reality that people live busy lives. It's really tough to make a living for most people yeah. today. Oh, and if anything, embracing technology can assist in doing that by reducing the net cost of crime monitoring and prevention. Well, again, uh, I, I think I fully agree with you on that one. And again, I think it's important to note that uh, the security of individuals is something which I think even the most ardent libertarians or advocates of small government think is a legitimate role of government. And there are still ways uh, in which private individuals can band together and try and fulfill this need. Now, I'd also like to segue to another point. Um, and you did mention trying to make Makana more attractive to business. Now, the South African Constitution outlines a federal system of government for South Africa, but somehow we haven't really seen that, at least not nearly to the extent in certain countries like the United States uh, or Switzerland or a number of other countries which have, or Canada is another one, which have very federal systems and have a lot more power devolved. Do you think it would benefit South Africa if we devolved a lot more power to more local uh, strands of government, such as the municipal or the provincial level? Undoubtedly so, Nick, but I think we need to understand that the devolution of power in terms of our constitution is largely ruling party influenced. We have party lists as opposed to direct representation. Yes. In fact, it's only on municipal level and partially only that you have direct representation where approximately half of your municipal councillors are directly elected. The rest is proportional representation based on political party lists. The devolution of power, and South Africa has regrettably, despite its federal constitution, gone the other way, is almost self-evident. It's a no-brainer. Yes. The fact is that a community in the Eastern Cape with its own specific needs is the best entity to decide what it is that they need for themselves. They certainly do not need a faceless bureaucracy in Cape Town or Pretoria dictating what particular education or requirements there are. There are demographic, ethnographic differences. There are infrastructural differences, weather issues, which are not constant throughout the country. So it's certainly best for a family to decide what is best for their own family and not for some faceless authority somewhere else to dictate those terms. Absolutely. And, you know, I've always been a fan um, in terms of freedom. I think we often neglect to think about the freedom to secede, the freedom to, to have that. There's a country in Europe called Liechtenstein, a very small uh, alpine country just nestled in between Austria and Switzerland, uh, which is very interesting, I think, to look at because it has in its constitution that every single one of the villages in Liechtenstein has the right to succeed or to, to secede, rather, if they get a certain number of signatures and they must then hold a referendum, they are compelled to, I think, by their constitution, and they are allowed to secede if they like. Now, we don't quite have it to that level, uh, but like you said, a government at a much more local level that knows the people on the ground and knows the, speci the specific uh, conditions of the place, you know, a municipality in the Northern Cape is not going to be the same as a municipality in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, now, there's always been a downside to this, I've thought, which is that when you do devolve power a bit more, you sort of risk devolving power to governments which are not nearly as good as what they perhaps could be. We could always devolve power to a terrible, corrupt, totalitarian municipality somewhere, and unfortunately the people in that place would have to live under that horrible system. So it seems to me like there's almost a risk when it does come to the devolution of power, with this being said, I think about the fact that Makana is currently insolvent. We clearly do not have a very good bunch managing our finances at the top. Suppose, supposing our municipality were to get a lot more power, perhaps have a lot more control over its fiscal policy, i.e. Uh, receive less money from provincial and national governments and, and be able to levy its own 
rates and taxes to a greater extent to fund its own budget to a greater extent. Do you think that would be a net positive or a net be- uh, negative on the town? Well, Nick, uh, let me just start by saying that devolution of power in itself always carries the risk of uh, some autocrat or dictator coming to power and ruling people in a way that they don't wish to be ruled. But the more devolution of power you have and the more independence per min- in a municipality, the outcomes are better because effectively smaller municipalities compete against each other for the prize, which is human capital yeah. and the benefits that that brings. So I would rather be in a situation where Makana as a municipality is potentially corrupt and I can move to Ndlambe, which offers far better prospects for myself and my family than the current situation where my only choice is to leave South Africa or stay, which is Precisely. an entirely different situation. And people already do that, it's important to note. Uh, you know, it's not an accident that there are millions of Zimbabweans living in South Africa. And my personal view is I encourage Zimbabweans to come here if they think their lives are going to be better because people vote with their feet when they can't vote with their ballot, unfortunately. Yes, and... and uh it's often misunderstood, but uh, immigrants, and I'm, I refer specifically to immigrants, not refugees, often make the best citizens because before they've even left, they've taken the decision to be resourceful and to be self-empowered sufficiently to make a move from one region to the next, which is extremely brave and shows a lot of character in itself. Speaking of self-determination, yes. devolution of power and secession... Uh, South Africa's constitution does provide somewhat for that under section 235, which allows for communities uh, sharing a common language, culture, or heritage to acquire certain rights uh, of self-determination and self-rule. And, of course, one example, infamous as it may be, is Orania in the Northern Cape. Naturally. Uh, and if anybody ever has the chance... I would recommend visit, uh, engage with the townsfolk and see how they have taken literally an arid piece of desert and turned it into an oasis of possibility. The other town which is not, or community which is really not well known, is right in the Eastern Cape, quite close to Grahamstown, the community of Enya Mani, which is attempting to do something similar and uh, encouraging community members to be more self-sufficient and independent of central and even provincial government. Yes, well, we here we have two examples, which are sort of polar opposites in terms of uh, socio-cultural environments that they are in. Obviously, Urania is a very conservative Afrikaans uh, town that, you know, the aim was to pr- preservation of their culture. And But here we have, you know, this, essentially the same thing in the Eastern Cape. And what I also find quite interesting is that very recently in the National Assembly, uh, the leader of the IFP, Mangasutu Butlezi, has raised the case of a certain trust in KZN. I don't know, do, would you have the name of that I don't have it offhand, uh, but uh, if you study the manifesto of the Encarta Freedom Party, uh, you'll see that their constitution and policies are decidedly federal uh, and promote the devolution of power and individual rights and responsibilities. And that is quite interesting to note because the IFP is really a Zulu nationalist party. They, you know, their primary voting base are rural, uh, is rural KZN. And they have almost recognized that as a result of them being a political party which is nationalist in its nature, they want to look after their own group of people, and the best way they can do that is through having a more federal, more devolved system, as well as being a party which seems to look out for property rights. We've recently been having a debate over land expropriation without compensation, uh, which is a bit scary for many because we know what happened in Zimbabwe. And there have been two major voices I've heard who have raised opposition to this, and the one has been Mosiwa Lakota from COPE, and I think the other one, I hope I'm not getting this wrong, is, uh, is the IFP, because they see that the problems that, that this brings, um, and so on and so forth. Nick, it's, uh, by the way, 
uh, as a point of interest, it's not only Zimbabwe yeah. that offers examples of expropriation without... Venezuela. <laughs> there's Venezuela and, in fact, in South Africa. What is not commonly appreciated is that the mineral rights that were privately held oh, yes. <laughs> in South Africa, of which there were millions uh, of hectares, uh, were expropriated in effect without any compensation. What happened Are is... You, I'm sorry to interrupt. Are you referring to a piece of legislation that was recently passed, like this was a couple of years ago? Was This, a, about this, a, this was a few years ago okay. where uh, South Africa has a joint mineral right ownership uh, regime where either the state or private sector or private people own mineral rights. And effectively legislation was introduced making the government the custodian of the mineral rights. I do remember this now. Yes. So, in effect, what you have is a title deed that says you own the rights for the minerals and you own the minerals themselves that are mined, but the custodian, which is the government, uh, decides how that is done. So, the best example is you owning a house, having the title deed for that house, but the government determining who may stay in the house, what rent you may charge, and the actual ownership uh, structure within the property. The result of that has been a mining industry which you can see has been in decline for many, many years. And there are other factors as well. Uh, commodity markets come and go. There are certain commodities, uh, precious metals, which yeah. have become more difficult to mine. Of course. Yeah. Resources. However, South Africa missed the commodities boom of the late... Uh, 90s. To, 90, to, in, into the 2000s. And the mining industry currently is in a state of decline with South Africa going from the foremost producer of gold in the world, producing 80% of the world's gold, to now position number seven. Yes, I remember the day that we dropped by, to second place and how big of a news story that was. So the fact that we are down to number seven, look, I, when we talk about commodities, my first thought immediately is, well, are we, are we not just running out of finite minerals, uh, perhaps? Uh, but you're right. We do have a sort of, and uh, look, I don't want to sp sound all conspiratorial here, but there's been some interesting talk about the sort of insidious government regulations that most citizens don't really uh, know about, things like the mining charter, uh, the BEE uh, regulations that are put on some businesses, which, you know, I'm not opposed to affirmative action type policies uh, as an idea or as a principle of trying to help the poor uh, be lifted out of poverty. But the problem is that some of these are taken to such an extent that they basically f f um, foster an environment where corruption can run wild. And when you have problems like this, where your property rights are conditional uh, and the regulatory environment is, is not conducive to making a business, we start to become a country where foreign investors don't feel satisfied uh, in putting their money uh, in South Africa. And why put your money in a country like ours when you can go put your money somewhere else, which has much nicer resources than ours and probably much, uh, much less of a regulatory burden? And I can think of a few that come to mind. I think Australia is, is, a, is a good example of that, perhaps. Nick, uh, you're quite right. In fact, it would be prudent for all citizens of any country to understand that it is a global economy. Um, South Africa is one of more than 200 countries and regions. And within those regions, uh, several times the amount of provincial and local governments all competing with each other to attract investment wealth, uh, technology, and other forms of abundance creation. And it's not so much the regulatory burden, but to know that there is a stable legislative and regulatory regime where if you make an investment, which in the case of mining, which is something I know about being in the industry, uh, your investment terms and spans are over 20 or 30 years. And you need assurances that that investment is protected and they will not change the game halfway through. Absolutely. And that's why, you know, almost having just an environment that's consistent is often the key to getting uh, more capital flowing into the country, more investment and so on and so forth. 
Um, now, I, I'd also like to bring a point which I think is going to be a big positive for South Africa, and that was, it happened quite a while ago, but the SACP effectively splitting from the ANC, and I think they will be contesting our next set of elections as a separate political party. In my view, there were a lot of guys in the SACP who were pushing policies that were really not so fantastic. So I, I really have a bit of hope, I think, in that regard, that we might see the ANC turn a bit on this. However, with Cyril Ramaphosa's recent speech um, regarding land expropriation, I get a little bit nervous again, although he does seem to be committed to more of a restorative rather than a redistributive view of, of property rights, at least. Uh, but we'll have to see how that goes. Now, one of the ways free marketers have sort of tried to get around all of this is the advent of cryptocurrency. And I think the time I most appreciated cryptocurrency and where it can fill in the gaps for where government gets into the way of these things is when I traveled overseas and I had to exchange rands into foreign currency and I saw the enormous tariffs and fees I had to pay just to change and all the forms I had to fill out, a lot of which is as a result of um, the South African Reserve Bank, which you know, keeps a monopoly on the money supply. So I understand that you are a fairly avid trader in uh, cryptocurrencies. I've become a little bit skeptical of them recently. Let me uh, start off by asking you, uh, do you think cryptocurrencies are a good investment? Cryptocurrencies to my mind, are not an investment. It is a vehicle through which you can trade. And that, in effect, is what it is. The reason that there's such volatility uh, in cryptocurrencies is, firstly, because it is a relatively new phenomenon. Yeah. Um, and people are, are, are... It's almost like an effect where the more people get onto it, the more... It's like a, an exponential effect in terms of its popularity, and that's made it very... It, it's, been, it's gone up and up and up, but it's been also very unstable. It's been very unstable, and at this point, up to several hundred different cryptocurrencies have been launched, and I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. The more, the merrier, and let the market decide based on integrity of the currency, uh, its tradability, its reputation, whatever backs it up. Let the market decide who should uh, win out and predominate. And at the moment, you've got a few um, prominent cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin and things like Ethereum and Dash. And as they evolve, they become more tradable, they become easier to use, and the technology and protections around it evolve as well. I think what the aspect of cryptocurrencies that is most exciting is that you have attached to many of them the concept of crypto contracts. Oh, yes. This is where Ethereum has become quite exciting, I believe. I don't Correct. know if I'm right or wrong there. So uh, a crypto contract is a simple thing. It basically says there are a set of circumstances which trigger uh, an event. Yeah. And those circumstances could be the delivery of goods to my house. And uh, based on that, there is an event that then happens, whether it's a verification or a thumbprint and an event is triggered in this case it would be the release of funds to a third party account so you're saying that it, it could be used almost as a very convenient payment uh, vehicle or is there something even more to these contracts one of the most exciting developments in crypto contracts is the fact that the applications are almost limitless and I think this is why authorities feel most threatened by them. And a good example would be your ubiquitous title deed on a property. Oh, of course, yes. So a title deed, uh, at least in South Africa, and property transfer is extremely laborious. And the government has a monopoly on the holding and issuing of title deeds. So the question is, why should that be in government hands? If there is a mechanism that a willing buyer and willing seller respect and agree to, uh, government doesn't have to be involved in that at all. Well, I'm, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but I'm just interested to ask, is the buying and selling of property rights not something which is covered in South African contract law, or is this a whole regulatory process itself? The buying and selling of property is in contract law. There are mechanisms ostensibly to prevent abuse and protections that have been developed over the years which require a lot of 
extra expense and those are specialized legal services in the form of conveyances and people who are only authorized by the state to conduct these uh, transfers and then the retention of documents and the issuing of documents uh, and those are all highly highly regulated now a crypto contract would work on exactly the same basis as any contract so you would have a title deed but the individual who had the crypto code or the set of numbers or algorithms to release could be able literally in a split second to transfer that property or that asset to another owner and there could be all sorts of safeguards built into the system which would ensure that that transaction occurs. So I'm just trying to sort of conceptualize what this is because I have heard of this term before and if I'm uh, not mistaken this is why Ethereum became such a big thing is because I think the code in Ethereum allowed uh, for these smart contracts. I've also heard that term being floated around uh, to take place. So for example, if, if I wanted to buy your car, you're selling your car and we create a crypto contract, within that contract there would be some sort of code and upon you presenting the car to me, I would what? Put this code in on my well, uh, wallet or well, how would that? Fortunately, <laughs> with mechanical things, it's relatively simple because you can either switch them on or off and it requires a code or a mechanism to do that. So in your example, if I sold you my car, uh, I would be selling you the code which would allow you access to start the vehicle and to access it. Oh, okay, I see. And once you have that code, you are free to change it, modify it as you wish, and obviously you need to look after that piece of information very carefully. Because oh, yes. <laughs> if you lose it or don't have mechanisms to recover it, uh, effectively you are, you've lost the use of the vehicle. And uh, these crypto contracts are, in fact, in use pretty much every day. You have smart contracts being used abroad by car hire companies where they would give you a code or a particular piece of software in hotel rooms to access your hotel room. Oh, that yes. is a smart contract. You have a programmed card with a set code on it that allows you access to that room and to the facilities in that room for a set period of time. So this is nothing new. It's just that we need to expand our thinking and our open-mindedness to allow for these possibilities to become part of our everyday lives. Well, you know, it's a very interesting take on it. I, I will be honest with you, I've been a little bit critical of cryptocurrency recently when I was thinking about it and comparing it as a means of exchange and then also as an investment. Now, I think the interesting thing is that a lot of people have now recently been using cryptocurrencies as a means of investment. I think um, the Winklevoss twins or one of the Winklevoss twins who were part of the whole thing in the founding of Facebook recently became Bitcoin millionaires or Bitcoin billionaires. I can't remember which one. Uh, and that's why it's been so erratic going up and down because you have all these active traders on the markets uh, changing the price the whole time. Um, and, and that made me a little bit skeptical of the viability of cryptos as a good means for exchange. Because if you have something like Bitcoin, for example, which up until very, very recently was just appreciating in value the whole time, you effectively would never really have the right opportunity cost for you to spend any amount of crypto, or any amount of Bitcoin at least, to buy something. Because if your currency would just keep appreciating in value, you would always think, well, why buy this today when I can buy it tomorrow when my crypto wallet will be worth more and then you could always say well why buy it tomorrow when I could buy it the next day and I think that was unfortunately one of the problems I, I had um, I have personally been very intrigued by a company called gold money um, have you heard of that name before I don't know if you're aware of them well if it's a cryptocurrency backed by a no, standard of value which is gold not not quite like that it's effectively like a bank account except instead of depositing money into account you buy gold and you can actually choose which vault around the world your, your gold is located in. And they give you a, a debit card. And you can use your debit card just like you use anything else. It just basically deducts that much gold off your account. And the reason why I kind of like that 
was because gold's price over the last however many decades has been uh, relatively constant. It will obviously go up and down depending on active traders on the market and then also the scarcity of, of gold as a, as a precious metal. But compared to fiat currency and cryptos, it's incredibly stable. And I've always thought, you know, imagine if you were a wealthy Zimbabwean in the 1990s and you had bought a whole lot of gold when the Zimbabwean dollar was, I think, stronger than the US dollar. I hope I'm not making a mistake with that. I believe it was at one time. And then comes 2007 and the currency completely collapses. But unlike your comrades, you have a whole lot of gold stored, so you can go and use that. It hasn't depreciated in value as the Zim dollar has. Uh, it's just been there because it's this physical thing which is tangible and has actual uses. So I have personally been leaning more towards um, currency, as Austrian economists would say, sound money. And I quite like that idea. What do you think of the, uh, you know, I don't think this will happen anytime soon, but what do you think about like a gold or a silver standard? Well, Nick, I, I think you've uh, asked and answered your own question <clears throat> extremely well. Uh, we're in a, in a town called Grahamstown. We are surrounded by amazing technology, human capital, and the ability for you or any other person in this town to start their own cryptocurrency that is backed up by a recognizable store of value. In your case, you mentioned gold. It could be anything in particular. But gold is universal. Could be known. water these days. <laughs> <laughs> in Cape Town, it could be water. I may have bad news for you that if it really starts raining heavily in Cape Town, the value of your crypto water would be diminished dramatically. Yeah, maybe in Namibia we could try using water, <laughs> but they seem to be very good at conserving. Anyway, I but would... You've made a, a, an excellent point. There is nothing stopping anybody starting a currency that is backed up by proper value. And I think the key to that is to ensure that that value is recognized. And the means of recognition are available. It's good governance, it's good corporate ethics, it's establishing that value and coupling it to a reputable firm or set of circumstances which provide people the confidence to trade it. Um, so the idea of cryptocurrencies evolving where they are backed by a universal recognizable store of value is sound and I believe that's where it will go in the future. And those cryptocurrencies, which are exceptionally volatile and speculative, will have their place as well. Well, I think the prospect of a gold-backed cryptocurrency, that just sounds to me like almost like a libertarian utopia. It's like combining <laughs> some really awesome ideas there. And I can't wait for one to come out. And I'm sure that if that idea is indeed viable, the way the world works is that someone will do it eventually. So I think that's a great way to end off. Ron, thanks very much for uh, talking about all these ideas, and I wish you the best of luck in help to helping to improve our little town. Thanks, Dick. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, being part of this project and seeing the spontaneous order that's been created in the community. Uh, in fact, on my way here, I saw an entire class uh, from one of the schools uh, collecting garbage around town and oh, uh, making sure the main streets look a little bit better. A year ago that would probably not have happened and it's just a delight to see how this is evolving. Absolutely, it really is. It's a really fantastic positive and it's a, sto a positive story and it's a story which has given me a lot of hope and restored my faith in humanity, so to speak. Anyway, thanks very much for everyone for listening to this episode of How to Build the Roads and we'll catch you next time.